Good morning. Sorry for the delay. I had some unknown last minute housekeeping details to take care of. Welcome to those of you here in the sanctuary and watching online, especially if you knew Pastor was not going to be here today. You get me. So I very much appreciate it. I'm going to take it all as a positive sign and show of support uh, that you all are here today. Um, with that being said, the comment of those of you watching from home, Emily, are you able to monitor any prayer concerns that come in on that for me today? I know Cheryl usually does that. Pastor takes care of that, but I am, however, not. You don't want me to do that. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. I got enough going on up here. This is all good. It's all good. So welcome. Um, I'd like you to take a few moments, close your eyes, shut the world out, imagine that restful place where you feel most at ease, most able to open yourself to the things of the world and of the Holy Spirit. So this can truly be a replenishing time for you. For those of you who are at home, same thing. It's real easy to just let your mind keep going and make that litany of things you want to take care of today when service is done, but try to shut it all out, be present, and make this time with Christ your own personal meditation time. With that being said, let us start our formal worship together with our gathering hymn. Uh, this is from the little thin hymnal, the blue one, 2128. Come and find your quiet center. Good morning. Our call to worship today is from the Old Testament book of Psalms. Psalms is authored by many individuals, including David, who is thought to be responsible for over 70 of the Psalms, including our own today. Hebrew poetry often uses pairs of lines with the second line either supporting the first or providing an opposite insight. Blessed are those who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or 
but their delight is in the law of the Lord. They are like trees planted by streams of water that yield their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked will perish. Join me in the unison prayer. Heavenly Father, creator of heaven and earth, we have gathered here today to worship you. We thank you for this time together and sing our praise and study your word. May you increase our understanding that you are the light that directs our paths. Help us to rely on you entirely and grow in you more. We look to your word for encouragement, counsel, and strength. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray and believe. Amen. Thank you. Join me in the unison prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast 
the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first scripture today is Galatia, from Galatians. Galatians is found in the New Testament, an epistle, a Pauline scripture, which means it is a letter written by Paul to the Christian church in the Roman province of Galatia. This area is now found in modern day Turkey, provinces of Ankara and Ekashir in the highlands of central Anatolia. Galatians 1, verses 1 through 10. Live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore him, saving your critical comments for yourself. You may be needing forgiveness before the day is out. Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens, so complete Christ's law. If you think you are too good for that, you are badly deceived. Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work you have been given, and, the sink, and then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. Be very sure now, you who have been trained to a self-sufficient maturity, that you enter into a generous common life with those who have trained you, sharing all the good things that you have and experience. Don't be misled. No one makes a fool of God. What a person plants, he will harvest. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. All he'll have to show for his life is weeds, but the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvests a crop of real life, eternal life. So let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit. Right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. Our next hymn is number 585, This Little Light of Mine. And we're going to play it through first because it is a little different than the version that you used to hear in the children sing. This is the, the uh, hymnal version. Um, so we're going to play it through so you're familiar, and then we'll ask you all to join in.
Our reading from Matthew is found in the first of the four Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. Let me tell you why you are here. You are here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If, you make, if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that you've been put there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. The second reading is um, from Re Revelation. The last book of the New Testament was written by John the Apostle while in exile on the island of Patmos. He was trying to provide hope and encouragement to the seven churches in Asia. Each church was having its own issues. Today we hear about the issues in Laodicea. Write to the Laodicea, to the angel of the church, God's yes, the faithful and accurate witness, the first of God's creation, says, I know you inside and out and find little to my liking. You are not cold, you are not hot. Far better to be either cold or hot. You're stale, you're stagnant. You make me want to vomit. To bra you brag, I'm rich, I've got it made. I'd need nothing from anyone, obvious that in, that in fact you are a pitiful, blind beggar, threadbare and homeless. Here's what I want you to do. Buy your gold from me, gold that's been through the refiner's fire. Then you'll be rich. Buy your clothes from me, clothes designed in heaven. You've gone around half naked long enough. And buy medicine for your eyes from me, so you can see, really see. The people I love, I call to account, prod and correct and guide so that they'll live at their best. Up on your feet then, about face, run after God. like that this is smaller, but everything keeps falling off. So those of you who know me know how much I love my coffee. I praise God every morning for whoever he planted that seed into. Take this bean and dry it and grind it and mix it with some water. And I like my coffee really hot, like really, really hot. When Greg and I travel, we often start with a big travel cup of coffee, and I start with it while it's really hot. And then I pass it off to Greg when it starts getting too cool, because then it's perfect for him, unless one of us is sick. Mm. It kind of reminds me of that story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, where the porridge is just right. Mm my mouth. Hmm. Lukewarm. I like my water cold. Really cold. Mm. So cold it makes your feelings hurt. For those of you who don't have feelings, we'll talk later. Oh, that's better. But I am a girl of extremes. I like my hots hot. I like my colds cold. None of this room temperature lukewarm garbage. And our scripture warns us about lukewarm, but not in our drinks. 
it warns us about our faith. So the scripture today from Revelation warns the people of Laodicea about becoming lukewarm. So Laodicea was positioned at the crossroads of major biblical trade routes. Because of this, it's also a major banking center. It's located in what's now modern-day Turkey, in the southwest near the modern-day city of Denizli. Laodicea had wealth. It had a lot of wealth. And it had almost everything except water. It was built because of its position along the trade route, but it had no access to decent water, like Heropolis up in the mountains who had fresh cold water from the snowmelt. It didn't have that. Its water was brought in by elaborate aqueducts that they had built, but it left it warm and mineral laden. The affluence of Laodicea left them the ability to obtain and possess anything that came its way, and a few things it had to go in search of. This affluence made the city, shall we say, overly independent. They began to believe and act as though they needed nothing from anyone, including God. The people began to worship their wealth and possessions and the gifts of their life more than the giver. You may remember from other teachings that the book of Deuteronomy warned the people of the Old Testament times not to forget that it was God who fought alongside them that allowed them to reap all the benefits and wealth from their conquered lands. Here the people of the New Testament are making the same mistake, loving the gift more than the giver. Perhaps that is why many people believe Christ has more of a presence in prisons than in boardrooms. The idea of a self-made man or self-made woman simply cannot exist for anyone who calls himself a child of God. We must praise God from whom all our blessings flow. We too can easily become like the citizens of Laodicea. We chase after the job with the most money, work overtime for even more money so we can buy newer, buy bigger, and buy better. We start taking credit for our success forgetting to thank God who helped make us all we are and give us all we have. And we find it hard to part with what we have obtained, even if it is to give back to God. Now don't worry, this is not going to become a tithing message. I'll leave that for Pastor and Finance Committee probably next month. But what we give back is directly related to how we feel about what God helps us to achieve. As we continued in our reading, it calls for us to come into account for ourselves. It states that we can truly be rich, but not by worldly possessions. As it was read for us right now, the people of Laodicea lived in spiritual poverty. They were pitiful, blind, threadbare, and homeless. They were like the lukewarm water from the aqueducts that came from Heropolis. They did not have God in their lives, and only he can provide that truly rich life and our home in heaven. So what are we to do about all of this? That is also answered for us in the readings. In verse 18, it says, Here's what I want you to do. Buy your gold from me gold that has been through the refiner's fire. Then you'll be rich. Buy your clothes from me, clothes designed in heaven. You've gone around half naked long enough. And buy medicine for your eyes from me, so you can see, really see. God knocks at our door, at the door of our souls. Let him in. Show the love he has for you to others. Don't hide behind the wealth of this world. Don't try to blend in. Don't be a chameleon. Live boldly the life Christ provides and let your light shine. Galatians 6 reminds us to not be impressed with our own rewards and to take a good look at ourselves and our choices. Do not be too critical of others, save that for yourself. And do not compare yourself to others, but rather be what God has called you to be. If someone strays, restore them. 
praise God, help others, live the scriptures, and share his word and promises. In Matthew's salt and light scripture, he puts it like this. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. For we all know what happens if we cover our light and cover it long enough. It snuffs it out completely. We become, as in our children's sermon, detached from our power with God. Be bright, don't hide. Be heavenly enriched. Go public. Does your life emulate these traits? Or do you blend in like the chameleon? God's people are the salt and the light. We are to be in the world, but not of it. Jesus calls us to remain a dissident relationship to the world without rigidly or isolating from it. That is a comment from the book that I read this week. It actually took me about a month to get through it. I'm a slow reader. But this is the basis of a lot of things that we're hearing today. It's called Chameleon Christianity, and it's written by the gentleman uh, Dick Keyes. And there's a lot of wonderful points that he made in here. Also in an article that I uh, read a numerous times, is called, Are You a Salty Christian? And there it states that Christians should be able to flavor those around them by living right. So it's sort of a visual flavoring. Kind of a do as I do, not just what I say. In biblical times, salt was included in grain offerings. You can read about that in Leviticus. Ezekiel talked about salt with the burnt offerings, and in Exodus, it was included in the incense. In Numbers and Chronicles, you can read about how it was used to ratify contracts. Ezekiel tells us how newborns were rubbed with salt in hopes to provide for good health. And in Judges, it talks about how salt was used to make enemy lands barren. So we are to keep our saltiness, but what exactly does that mean? In biblical times, salt was life. It preserved food before refrigeration. Salt has healing properties, point in fact the popularity of salt water spas. In Roman times, salt was even used as payment, as in some other early societies. It was used like money as it had such value, hence the expression being worth his salt. Salt adds flavors to food, making many things taste better, and it also makes one thirsty. And from that fact comes the mantra, where salt goes, water follows. It signifies permanence, loyalty, durability, and purification. And as Christians in society, we can be likened to a rock dropped into a pond that makes waves. Jesus calls us to make waves that are positive and transforming while we simultaneously keep our distinctive Christian identity. Today's society is fundamentally apathetic about many issues that Christians consider to be the most important. Does our life, our decisions, and our vote exemplify those feelings? So, exactly what do we do? The way we dress, the way we talk, we spend our money, how we spend our time, how we act towards others, in the article, Are You a Salty Christian? It lists these um, four suggestions. Be salt to season, as Christians should season the lives of others with love, just like salt seasons our food. Be salt to purify, as Christians should live pure lives just as salt purifies. Be salt to preserve, as Christians should preserve the Gospels of Jesus Christ, just as salt preserves our food. And use the salt, be the salt to produce thirt, thirst. For salty food makes people thirsty. Therefore, Christians should make unbelievers thirsty for the living water of Jesus. Thirsting for that living water of Jesus. That is a story for another time. The woman at the well from John chapter 4. 
But for now, let's concentrate on being a bright light that shines in the words and deeds of Christ, showing us the way to be helpful, to fulfill the needs of others, to be salty enough to preserve against the evils of an indulgent society. May God help make it so. Amen. Please join me in a hymn of praise and prayer with number 2193, again in the little thin blue hymnal, Lord, listen to your children praying. Let us close with a musical prayer in the regular hymnal, number 663, Savior again to thy dear name. Mm -hmm. 